Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Brennan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks so much for joining us for another edition of Behind the Headlines. The lead up to the 2016 Republican presidential election has been unlike anything we've seen in recent election cycles. On the Republican side, businessman and reality TV star Donald Trump, once considered a sideshow, has maintained a consistent lead in the polls and garnered huge amounts of media attention along the way. In the Democratic race, Hillary Clinton was once thought to be a shoo-in for the nomination, but Senator Bernie Sanders, an avowed socialist, has kept the race surprisingly tight. Here today to help us make sense of all of this and to uh, discuss how the media has played a role in shaping uh, this presidential election is Professor Robert Schmull. Bob has, uh, is the Walter H. Annenberg Edmund P. Joyce Chair in American Studies and Journalism here at Notre Dame. He's also the director of the John W. Gallivan Program in Journalism, Ethics, and Democracy at Notre Dame. He's spent his career studying the intersection of media and politics. And 25 years ago, he authored a book which remains uh, very relevant today and especially to this discussion. The book was called Statecraft and Stagecraft, and its subtitle reads, American Political Life in the Age of Personality. Bob, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are uh, watching live today, I'll just give you a quick rundown on, on how the program is going to go. Bob is going to uh, walk us through his initial thoughts on today's topic, and afterwards he'll be answering your questions. You can submit your questions starting now, do so throughout the program. You can do so in the form you see below the streaming player where you're watching, where you're watching us. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Bob, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Uh you were kind enough, Kevin, to mention a 25-year-old uh, book. And as you said, the uh, subtitle is American Political Life in the Age of Personality. And by personality, I mean the way that a political figure is projected through the media. And I think that it's more important to focus on that these days than the way that um, you see the candidates operating within the party. And we'll get into that as we uh, go along. Certainly, as Kevin mentioned, um, this is a very strange, a very odd political year. Uh, instead of the age of personality, I think you might add on the age of Trump. And uh, the two do go together. I have often said, and indeed in front of a class uh, not long ago said that the way I viewed 2016 is that it was the combination of a reality show um, with Donald Trump as the protagonist, uh, but also um, part of it is uh, a revision, if you will, of the movie that came out uh, back in 1976 called Network where the anchor person uh, screams, uh, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, Donald Trump has become that anchor person. And in doing so, he has uh, certainly caught the attention of the media. And through the media, he has been able to put together a fairly large base of uh, support. And uh, to sort of flesh this out and give you um, um, an indication of how much he has dominated this particular race, there was a study done uh, at the end of 2015 of the network coverage, ABC, CBS, NBC, of their nightly news pro uh, programs. And the 2016 presidential campaign received 1,031 minutes of coverage. Well, Donald J. Trump received 32 percent of that, or 327 minutes. That was more than the combined uh, individuals who were competing, who are competing on the Democratic side. He received 327, Hillary Clinton 121, and then you drop to 
Jeb Bush at 57, Ben Carson at 57, Marco Rubio at 22, Ted Cruz at 21, and Bernie Sanders, the number two individual on the Democratic side with a mere 20 minutes of coverage. Um, those numbers don't take into account the uh, enormous amount of time that Donald Trump has received on the cable news networks. Um, he has been catnip for them. Uh, they can't seem to get enough of him. And uh, one could say that uh, he also has been the beneficiary of so much coverage on the Sunday morning public affairs program. And he has done something over and over again that I've never seen um, in watching this for well over 30 years. Um, he is able to call in uh, to these Sunday morning programs rather than appearing in the studio. Um, I have this image it, in my head of, of Donald Trump sitting in silk pajamas in Trump Tower uh, playing on the phone, calling Face the Nation and This Week and Meet the Press um, to air his views and to uh, present his uh, message. Now, I think that it's important to talk about the relationship of the media to the time. And I would argue that uh, someone like Donald Trump fits the time. And by that I mean that there is a good deal of anger out in the uh, country. Uh, I think that if you check that um, throughout the time that Barack Obama has been president, there has not been really a um, movement to say that uh, the country is going in the right direction. So there is a sense of malaise, there is a sense of economic insecurity, of economic anxiety, uh, and he has been able to tap into that with his rhetoric and his use of the media. Uh, other candidates who have been successful at doing this, I would argue, would be Ted Cruz, who is also on the Republican side, to a degree Ben Carson, although I think that his uh, time has sort of elapsed uh, if you look at uh, uh, his support at this particular time. It's interesting to me that Bernie Sanders received so much attention in the later part of the summer and into the early fall and then seemed to disappear from our uh, real consciousness, uh, but he's back, and he's another uh, outside candidate um, who is uh, having an impact on that, on this race, and also using the media quite uh, masterfully in getting his uh, message across. So that as we go forward and talk about this, and, and Kevin and I welcome your uh, questions, um, I think it's important to always look at what the media are covering and what the media are uh, giving us. And they're covering the reality that is out there. Um, as I said, um, if there is an anger in the populace, it's anxiety uh, and a certain amount of fear. Uh, and in the case of 2016, although the obituaries of uh, Donald Trump have been written really from the day that he got in, in June, uh, when he made the announcement and said uh, the Mexicans uh, were rapists and criminals and all that, um, at every point that his um, candidacy has been in jeopardy, he has been able to recover and indeed to become stronger in doing it. Uh, in part, and I will end here, but in part, that is the mastery of one individual in using the media to get out the message 
that would help his uh, candidacy for the presidency. Thanks, Bob. A uh, reminder to all of you who are watching today's program live, now Bob's going to be taking your questions about the, uh, the media and the presidential race. You can start submitting them now. Do so throughout the show. Remember, you submit them using the form just below uh, the streaming player where you're watching us. Um, you, you spoke about Donald uh, Trump quite a bit there, Bob, and you know the, the huge um, amounts of attention he's gotten on network news, on cable news compared to the other candidates. I think there's a charge you see out there among um, voters, people on social media, um, coming from, I guess, critics of, uh, of Trump that, and critics of the media, that the media has kind of enabled Donald Trump by giving him so much attention and that um, he's a been able to maintain his momentum because he gets so much more attention. And I think the implication is in giving him so much attention, the media is kind of not doing its job or, or not acting, you know, totally ethically. Is that a, is that a fair charge against the media? I'm not sure it's a fair charge. I think it's, uh, I think it's more complicated. Um, I think that um, what you tend to see in the media is the real bias in favor of a good story. And um, let's face it, all one has to do is look at the numbers of people who have watched the debates. Uh, first one, and I think the second one, over 20 million people. And um, every observer who I would have read or talked to said, you know, that is Donald Trump's phenomenon mm -hmm. uh, in, in action. So when you say it has enabled him, uh, certainly it has advanced his cause um, but he has been the maestro of the media, and he has been able to orchestrate exactly what he wanted to deliver in the way of a message at a given time. All one has to do is look at the last debate in Iowa. And he boycotted that debate, and yet received the most coverage. The candidates who debated didn't get nearly as much coverage as Donald Trump for doing a counter uh, programming um, event uh, right at the same time as the, uh, as the debate. So that um, what we have here is somebody who is so involved in the day-to-day -day cycle of the media that the media doesn't catch its collective breath to do much in the way of background reporting about him. And again, uh, trying to suggest in the little opening uh, that we did uh, that this is very much uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. A Republican candidate for the presidency basically sticking it to Fox News and his supporters really enjoying that, applauding that. Um, what it says to me um, is he is willing to take on any force that he thinks is getting in the way of, uh, of his candidacy and uh, he's running around the uh, Republican Party, by that I mean an end around, um, he's running around Fox News, um, and he's calling all these shows on Sunday to be sure that they know that he's out there and wants to say something. All right, well, we've got our first question coming in here from the audience. Uh, this question comes from uh, Stephen, and it, he asks, what impact do you feel social media has played in shaping the current mainstream media? I think it's accelerated it tremendously. Uh, and by that I mean that um, I would follow some reporters on, uh, on Twitter and I can see them uh, tweeting and then the story catching fire and being uh, distributed broadly throughout the, uh, the mainstream media. Um, I don't want to overly dwell on, on Trump 
so we'll, uh, we'll just say this and then move on. But uh, I think his use of Twitter and some of these other social media outlets, uh, they have been very helpful to him. Uh, and um, I got a kick during the, um, during the Christmas season um, that he, he would come out um, with a tweet of one kind or another, and about every 12th one was uh, autographing copies of my book makes wonderful Christmas present, you know. So here's the consummate salesman engaged in a uh, presidential campaign who's still hawking his, uh, uh, his most recent book. I mean, the man, I said in front of a group not long ago that if the Nobel Committee gave a Nobel Prize for self-promotion, he would not only win it, he'd retire the competition. <laughs> In, uh, in the one year that it was offered. Um, you know, social media, you said, has really kind of accelerated the media. Um, how much has it affected sort of traditional media, the ability that voters have to follow, you know, on Twitter and, and Snapchat and all these other things, to follow not just reporters and see little snippets of, of Donald Trump at rallies, but as you said, to follow the candidates themselves on Twitter has that damaged the influence of, you know, traditional media, newspapers? Newspaper endorsements were once hugely important in a lot of these primary states, the Des Moines Register mm -hmm. in Iowa, the uh, union leader in New Hampshire. Now you look at when they give out these endorsements on the Republican side, the Des Moines Register, I think, endorsed Rubio, the union leader endorsed Chris Christie, and you're not seeing them jump in the polls as a result in those states. How has sort of the advent of new media and its continued evolution um, devalued traditional media outlets? I think that um, that's one piece of the puzzle. And by that I mean that there has been such a growth in the media as a whole in the past several years that the audience is so fragmented and people are getting their information from so many different sources that for me to even mention the nightly news broadcasts, um, probably some in your audience are thinking, you know, that's a Neanderthal view. Uh, I haven't watched an evening news broadcast in, in uh, 10 or 15 years. They're no longer um, that important. They are important in this sense that um, they're the front page of the, uh, of the networks. And they still have an audience, and their audience is primarily older, and those are the people who vote. Mm -hmm. So you got to take all that into uh, into account. But when you say, you know, what has social media done uh, to the uh, to our understanding of politics and political culture? What all of the different media, including social media, have done is um, made us more aware of the different possibilities to receive information. We are no longer hamstrung by the major newspaper, say, in a state or in the country. We're no longer bound to the three networks. Uh, everything is, is much more open. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, there would be many people in this country who would receive the bulk of their political information from talk radio. And we have to be aware of, of that. So that uh, I would argue that the journalistic values of talk radio are quite a bit different from mainstream network uh, broadcasting. Okay. Uh, same is true that in terms of a newspaper and, say, a blog or a website that would have a particular slant. If people go to that website um, with frequency and that's their primary uh, source of information, sure, that will reinforce their thinking along that line, whatever that line might, uh, might be. Um, but that is really a consequence of this new age of uh, media 
And um, I think the candidates are um, increasingly trying to figure out exactly how to use it. Um, and quite frankly, again, I think that some have been doing it better than uh, others. And you have to be new today in order to get that message out. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question coming in here. Uh, our next question comes from Jim. What role does the media play in limiting misinformation? So I guess, you know, fact-checking things that the yep. candidates are saying. Uh, good question, and there are a number of different um, websites primarily that, uh, that exist that look at um, what a candidate would say and measure that against uh, the facts. Um, but I would argue that um, what we tend to see now is this certain amount of hostility that is directed at the media writ large. And there would be people who would um, be told that a statement was not factual and they still would not have any doubts about the person who spoke that. And that is, um, that's part of this uh, new media landscape that we are uh, talking about. One of the concerns that I have, and it's probably uh, one of the biggest ones, is that um, certain viewpoints and facts get out there they're challenged, but they're never resolved. And it ends up being uh, sort of a, a match between the one source that might be ideal, ideological in nature uh, and another one. And the public, I would be a, a devout independent, no, no dog in the fight. Um, I just would like to know what's accurate and what's truthful. Oftentimes, that is more difficult um, today, and this is a great irony of the media. There's so many different outlets, and yet our ability to nail down exactly uh, where something stands and, and how it's shaped uh, becomes a little more difficult because of the slant that takes place. Along with that issue has kind of the, the age of personality that yeah. you... Um, discussed earlier, teamed with um, social media, the continuing advances of the internet, someone's ability to follow elections that way versus, you know, reading about it in a newspaper, longer kind of articles um, that maybe folks did 40 years ago. Um, has that led to a less educated uh, electorate on the issues facing the country as more attention is paid to personal attacks and sort of the, the personalities of the candidates? Uh, I think that's, uh, is, it's not something that you could answer definitively one way or another for this reason. And again, uh, I'm trying to describe the media landscape uh, as accurately as I can. I would bet that um, if you wanted to find out about a particular candidate in great depth, it is easier for you today than ever before. The difference is that you have to take that initiative. You have to work, you have to sweat in order to, uh, to get to the bottom of, uh, of something. So that when you say is the electorate less informed, um, I think that's probably not the, uh, the best way to frame the question. Does the electorate take the initiative that it should in making decisions about candidates and issues? Uh, that's to me a more relevant and important kind of, uh, of question. Used to be, um, that when you had the three networks and just a few major newspapers, you had this limited supply of, uh, of information. Um, and you knew about things. 
Um, today, that's different. Again, because of the fragmentation, the scattering of the uh, of the different sources, um, so that it puts the burden on the individual, and uh, instead of sort of passively receiving an evening news broadcast, a newspaper, say, um, we all have to be a lot more active. And uh, as I said uh, just a moment ago, work at figuring out, um, you know, whether, I mean, is it even possible for someone who has never served a day in elective office to try to uh, win the highest office with the greatest responsibility that exists? I mean, that's a real question, uh, and maybe we need to study the past, his, his own uh, biography, to see how well he um, has dealt with issues like that. Reminder to those of you who are joining us live, Bob is taking your questions. You can submit them now using the form just beneath uh, the uh, streaming player where you're watching us. Let's go to our, uh, to our next question now. Uh, comes in from Adam. Trump has been able to grab the reins of the media. Why have other candidates, especially those that have had TV shows like John Kasich and Mike Huckabee, failed to do so or to adapt? Really good question. And uh, I would say it is uh, in large part the force of his personality. Uh, let's face it, he had uh, a reality program on uh, television for I think it was 10 or 12 years. He knows how to um, use the media. He knows how to gain attention. Uh, and what's remarkable to me is, you know, I will watch um, one of his um, speeches or presentations or whatever, and he, he throws, he throws uh, phrases around um, that are like little either firecrackers or grenades, and, you know, disgusting, miserable, terrible. And you're going, oh my, yeah, my gosh, I mean, hold back. I mean, let's be a little bit. No, uh, so that his ability to be a showman, uh, I think, is central to um, his success uh, so far. Some. A Notre Dame alumnus and good friend of mine sent me a note uh, recently uh, and said, you know, Trump grows on you. Well, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> maybe so. Uh, and that's interesting. I find it very interesting. I find myself watching him more closely just to see what it, uh, what it is. Whereas John Kasich was on Fox. Um, a different kind of presentation. Mike Huckabee, a different kind on, uh, on Fox as well. Um, and the key thing, I would argue, and uh, it'll take me just a, a moment to get this out, but uh, ever since 1976, Americans have almost um, on a a regular cycle for the presidency, picked outsiders. Um, certainly Jimmy Carter, one-term governor of, of Georgia, the next uh, Ronald Reagan, um, uh, who was a outsider ca uh, governor from California. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush does win uh, in 1988. Uh, many people would say that was the Reagan third term. Uh, next president, Bill Clinton, governor from Arkansas. Next one, um, George W. Bush from, uh, from Texas. Next one, um, a brand new senator from Illinois by the name of Barack Obama. Um, outsiders, um, if you don't want to include George Herbert Walker Bush in that category, that's fine. Uh, but mostly outsiders. And Donald Trump is the uber outsider, the person who's never been uh, involved in government, who is uh, 
taking on the establishment. Um, and so uh, someone like Kasich, long history in Washington as well as, uh, as governor of Ohio, Mike Huckabee, former governor of Arkansas, um, considered more on the establishment uh, side of the ledger. Uh, somebody like um, Trump and to a degree uh, Ted Cruz, certainly uh, Ben Carson, uh, not considered uh, to be insiders. They are, uh, they are outsiders. Um, yeah. um, obviously, you know, Trump is an outsider like all those mm -hmm. uh, presidents you mentioned. He's running a, his campaign in a manner that I think uh, is probably not similar to, to many of them. Uh, is there, you're a great student of American politics, is there a previous candidate for the presidency that you could compare Trump to, uh, who's, who he's running a similar campaign to, or is he sort of unlike anything we've ever seen before? He really is unlike anything that uh, we've seen before. Um, people would uh, make or draw the uh, parallel with Ross Perot, who ran and got uh, several million uh, votes back in 1992, also ran in 96. Um, but remember, he ran as an independent. Uh, that's different from uh, what Trump is trying to do within the, uh, the Republican Party. In terms of an individual, um, the one that I see the closest comparison that you could make uh, is uh, Huey Long, um, the senator, governor, uh, governor then senator, uh, who came from Louisiana um, and really wanted to run against uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. Um, and he was the consummate showman and would go around and uh, uh, give speeches that were um, funny uh, and also uh, inspiring uh, to, the, uh, to the people. Um, but I think, I think we're looking at someone who is very different. I mean, when you say George Wallace, there was the governor. He was a governor. Um, Trump is a business person and a performer. And uh, I think that makes him, plus he's playing within the, uh, the bounds uh, of the Republican Party. So I think that makes him different in that respect. Let's, uh, let's take our next question that's coming in from the audience. This is from Len. The average American voter understands the candidate's personality better than their political views and doctrine. How does, the, how does media coverage affect this? Well, I think that, um, that we do get a sense of uh, what they think through these debates. And um, I would argue that the debates this particular cycle have been um, of considerable value. One, in terms of the number of people who have watched. Two, in terms of the presentation, um, and by that I mean that they have been national in their orientation. Um, I'm old enough to remember when candidates used to go to an Iowa or a New Hampshire and make basically regional appeals. And uh, I think the debates have, uh, this year, have changed that and, and made them more national and international in the sense of dealing with um, issues abroad. Um, but again, as Len points out, the personality is, is hugely important. Um, and I mean, just put yourself in the, in the position of, say, Jeb Bush, two-term governor of Florida, flush with money, um, family background, uh, certainly on the presidential level, um, and he gets um, 57 minutes versus 327 minutes. Um, now, um, one could say that the dominant personality, meaning Trump, um, is able to um, 
get that kind of uh, attention, whereas um, the other candidates are languishing and trying, but not being very successful. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the Republican side. Yeah. Let's talk about the Democratic side a little bit. You know, at the beginning of the race, obviously, Hillary Clinton is essentially universally known uh, in, in the country. Probably not a huge percentage of Americans uh, knew Bernie Sanders, the senator from Vermont. Um, how has Senator Sanders been able to successfully maneuver the media landscape and the overall electoral process to, at this stage, make this a much closer race than I think almost anyone expected. It, <clears throat> excuse me. It is very interesting to me that uh, in 2008, she was inevitable. Uh, that didn't prove to be the case. And now uh, in 2016, she started as inevitable, and now she's on thin ice. Um, and I would go back to what I was suggesting a few minutes ago, which is, um, does she fit the political and media environment of this particular time? And I think that's a large and open question. Uh, I said that, um, that we are uh, really driven by outsiders. She's the consummate insider. Uh, I think that uh, in the case of Bernie Sanders, um, that you had someone who was speaking to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and we have to remember that in the caucuses, we tend to see the more extreme members of the party, whether it be on the Democratic side to the left or on the right with uh, the Republicans. Um, and so he has been able to sort of gin up interest in the issues of inequality, of economic insecurity, uh, the elites, and the moneyed classes of, uh, of New York. And uh, he's been able to build a campaign uh, around that. Um, and Mrs. Clinton is uh, certainly having difficulty uh, as we speak uh, in dealing uh, with him. I find it interesting that um, I would be someone who thinks that Barack Obama was an excellent political candidate for Barack Obama. Um, in terms of the party, um, we have a situation where Bernie Sanders is 74 years old. Mrs. Clinton is, uh, I believe, 68, 69. Uh, Martin O'Malley really doesn't figure in it in terms of 4%, 5% in the, in the polls. The Democrats don't have much of a bench. And they lost so many seats up and down the line in 2010 in the midterm and in 2014 in the midterm that I think the um, reconstruction job of the Democratic Party is going to be an important thing to uh, to watch as we uh, as we go forward. Having said that, all one has to do is look at what happened not so long ago in the uh, House of Representatives, and there the Republicans um, had their own civil war, and the Speaker left and was replaced by someone. Uh, someone else, so that these are not great times for the established political parties in this uh, country, whether it opens the door to someone like Michael Bloomberg, for example, uh, possible. Uh, he certainly would be a more credible independent than uh, Ross Perot was. But as we say, um, time will tell. Well, let's uh, let's talk about that. You brought up Michael Bloomberg. It's recently been floated that if, especially if Bernie Sanders wins the nomination mm -hmm. on the Democratic side and, and, and Trump or Cruz wins it on the Republican side, 
that he would be inclined to jump into the race and run as an independent. Um, you know, it, it, in recent political history, independents have never really had a serious chance of winning the presidency. Even Ross Perot was not um, a serious contender to win. Uh, do you think that under that hypothetical, uh, the former mayor of New York, uh, Mike Bloomberg, would, would have a real chance? I think that this political year has taught us that uh, everything is up for grabs. And um, as I say, neither party is flourishing as a political institution with force, with drive, with power. Um, so that somebody like uh, Bloomberg, who, you know, is worth several billion, and I think we're approaching maybe $50 billion, um, and if you would devote, you know, one of those billion to a candidacy, it would be um, uh, possible to get your, your message out. Um, I could see someone who has a track record in governing, mayor of uh, New York, um, that he could emerge as a serious uh, candidate, especially if, if it would play out that you have Donald Trump on the Republican, at the Republican head of the ticket, and uh, someone like Bernie Sanders. I mean, that is the alpha and omega of, uh, of political possibilities. I mean, a very rich billionaire and a socialist uh, at the head of either ticket, and then you put an independent uh, who is a moderate. The most recent Gallup poll um, of self-identification of, of voters had, um, I believe it was 29% said they were Democrat, 26% said they were uh, Republican, and the rest said they were independent. Well, that's a larger number. Uh, so that um, if he got into it, is there a possibility? I'm not going to say. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I, I'll say yes. Uh, All right. Uh, two billionaires and a socialist. That would be interesting. Uh, Welcome to America. A <laughs> uh, reminder for those of you watching live: you can keep submitting your questions. Uh, we've we've still got a few more minutes here. You can submit your questions using the form. Uh, underneath the uh, streaming player. We've got our next question coming in here from Jamie. The focus in the primaries has been on the problems, tapping into voter anger, but light on proposed solutions. Is this common for the primary phase, and can we expect more focus on solutions once we get to the general election? Good question. And um, I can remember uh, some years ago being involved in a, uh, a campaign and the um, uh, opposing figure uh, was masterful at describing the problems and making you feel as though uh, the problems deserved attention and should be solved. Uh, but that candidate never provided that kind of um, solution. And I, I think what what is uh, at the heart of that question is someone like Donald Trump's uh, way of dramatizing the way that the American people feel and it's miserable and terrible and you deserve better and all that. Uh, but then uh, pretty weak on the, the solutions that might follow. Um, really a situation where uh, the bombast of the description exceeds um, the intellectual force of a solution to that uh, problem. Um, you know, it, it's pretty easy to say, you know, I'll make a deal um, and I can do this. I mean, this isn't brain surgery and I'll get the Mexican government to pay for the wall and all that. Um, I mean, it's at this point rhetorical, uh, and I think uh, that question, and, and maybe some of the uh, viewers are uh, feeling the same thing, 
uh, when are we going to get to the brass tacks of uh, exactly what we could do to improve the state of this country and the state of this country vis-a-vis -vis the world? Let's take another question from the audience here. Okay, we're having some uh, some slight technical difficulties there. We talked about the uh, Democratic side earlier, yeah. and, and, and one of the things you mentioned uh, was kind of a lack of a, the bench on the Democratic yeah. side. And we also discussed how Hillary Clinton has struggled a little bit, surprisingly. It's, it's tempting to look back at Vice President Joe Biden, who, who passed on a race this time. He's obviously not the outsider type of candidate we discussed, but do you think... Uh, putting yourself in Vice President Biden's shoes or, or that of his advisors, do you think he at all regrets not getting into the race now that he's seen that you know, Hillary Clinton doesn't have the dominant lead that, that many expected her to have? Uh, Mark Shields, a wise and penetrating commentator on politics who was a graduate of Notre Dame, once said that the only cure for the presidential virus is embalming fluid, <laughs> uh, which uh, is not exactly a, um, a hopeful way of looking at things. Um, but anyone who uh, competed as he did um, in 1988 as well as in 2008 for the presidency, and somebody who has been around Washington for as long as he has, um, certainly would have doubts um, about not having uh, run the race. Um, I think, you know, and this may not prove to be at all uh, the case, but there is some talk that um, the FBI investigation of the emails could lead to something um, in terms of Mrs. Clinton. Um, would it be damaging enough that she um, couldn't go forward as a candidate? I don't know. Uh, certainly, my guess is that um, he would look at it again if that, uh, if that would happen. Um, you know, there's talk that Al Gore would even uh, think about it. There's talk that John Kerry would even <laughs> think about it. So that what I'm suggesting is that um, once you get close, um, it's really hard if the door even is open that much to not sort of reach for the uh, handle, open it, and walk through it. We've, we've talked also uh, about the kind of mood of the, the country and the electorate and, and folks feeling frustrated or anxious and about how Donald Trump has tapped into that. And uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when you kind of dig into the polls, Trump's biggest supporters among Republicans tend to be less educated. Mm -hmm. They tend to be from a uh, lower economic class. Is it uh, surprising that the person who is resonating with those sort of disaffected, frustrated voters happens to be a billionaire who in the past, you know, people might have viewed as kind of a symbol of elitism in terms of his fancy hotels and, and all his money. Is it odd that he's the one resonating with less educated, lower income, frustrated voters? Yes. Uh, but it goes right back to the question that was asked uh, earlier. And that is that um, he is dramatizing what um, um, he thinks is happening and uh, what the people are feeling. And he does it so well that he attracts their attention and they are willing to, uh, willing to support him. And you're exactly right. He is hitting at people usually uh, not college educated usually fifty thousand dollars or less in terms of uh, of income and um, to a certain extent he is tapping into what used to be called the reagan democrats and in his case and it'll be interesting to watch as the caucuses and the primary sort of unfold um, he is appealing to new voters people who haven't participated in the last 
few elections. Um, is he going to be able to bring them out? Is he going to be able to get them involved? Um, and I think that's the, uh, the real question. So that um, the, the climate is, as I mentioned before, uh, in favor of the outsider. And it is in favor of people who are taking on the elites or the powerful. On the Republican side, it means taking on government, okay, by and large. That's, uh, and to a certain extent, the media. Um, on the Democratic side, uh, it's a different sort of equation. And there you have uh, a Sanders taking on the, the banks and the hedge fund operators and all of that. And we're back into the um, inequality. In each case, they're going after elites and outsiders are um, really having an advantage but they're shooting at different uh, targets as they uh, frame their campaigns. We have another uh, question coming in from the audience here. This is, uh, comes in from Robert. Okay, we're having a, another brief technical difficulty there. Um, a lot of folks who've been, when you've been analyzing the, re the Republican race up to this point, shortly before uh, voting begins in the uh, first caucuses and primaries, have kind of been um, talking about the idea that there's always in recent elections a kind of conservative lane and an establishment lane and that usually one person emerges from each, they fight it out, and the establishment candidate wins. Mitt Romney in 2012, John McCain in 2008. And it seems like folks have been waiting for that establishment candidate to emerge. A lot of the attention and expectations heaped on Marco Rubio and yet it still seems to consistently be Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, both who you'd consider in that conservative lane, at the top, and an establishment candidate hasn't really, um, you know, brought it all together. Why is that? Um, I would uh, differ a little bit and say that I, the way I see it is that uh, Donald Trump is his own lane. And sure, he is battling uh, against a Ted Cruz, and both are perceived to be uh, outsiders. Uh, certainly, Donald Trump is positioning himself as a, uh, as a conservative. Um, but then, as you bring up his past, um, one would question whether that's um, authentic, uh, long term. Uh, he's a deal maker. He's a pragmatist, uh, by and large. So, uh, you know, let's go there. But the other uh, aspect of this is that you have um, the, the establishment people don't resonate because there is the, uh, the fact that the emphasis on the outsider makes the establishment figure less uh, appealing. To the, uh, to the voter. And um, the other factor, and it's um, easy to explain, there are a lot of them. So that um, you're going to have to remove a uh, Jeb Bush, who has a lot of money still. Uh, you're going to have to remove a John Kasich and a Chris Christie if you're going to anoint someone like Marco Rubio. And quite frankly, Jeb Bush doesn't want to anoint Marco <laughs> Rubio. And I don't think Kasich or Christie do either. So that um, uh, I don't see a quick emergence of a uh, uh, figure who would be more establishment oriented. One thing we've seen a lot of um, in this race on both sides is um, candidates criticizing the media. In the yeah. most recent debate in Iowa, Ted Cruz sparring with, uh, with Chris Wallace, Donald Trump obviously with lots of members of the media, particularly Megyn Kelly, and Bernie Sanders often criticizing questions and debates or media coverage in general as not being substantial enough. Do you think it is advantageous for candidates 
to uh, publicly kind of criticize the media and set themselves apart from the media, um, it, it, does that serve them well because of the public's overall view of the media? Yes. Um, I mean, the, uh, the Gallup organization does a uh, survey uh, every year. What is your uh, confidence level? of various institutions and um, quite frankly uh, journalism is not high on that level. Uh, of course neither is Congress um, and uh, the presidency is just uh, above that. But um, what, I'm or what I'm trying to suggest is the media are perceived to be a power force unto themselves. And if a candidate is able to turn the argument around and complain about the media, um, oftentimes the public is cheering that. Uh, they don't see anything wrong with that. And um, particularly um, on the uh, Republican side, uh, you see them going after the media and uh, uh, Donald Trump will point in the audience at the media and say, you know, they are doing a disservice to the uh, American people. And he'll get cheers. And, but quite frank, and I'm old, and I remember this. Back in 1964, that's exactly what happened at the uh, Republican convention, is that they pointed to the, uh, the, to the media and uh, uh, delivered very critical lines and everybody cheered. So, you know, this is an evergreen issue, shall we say. Sure. Um, one last question from the audience. We're running a bit low on time here. Uh, this is from Robert. This presidential race seems to be the race of extremes in terms of political ideologies. What role does the media play in this polarization? And do you see the growing divide in social ideologies a challenge for legislative progress in the future? Um, the answer is yes, yes, and, and yes, possibly. <laughs> uh, by that I mean that um, we've reached the point in our, uh, in our politics where uh, both of the parties seem to operate um, in places that are more extreme than consensus. And uh, I think that uh, in part, that is uh, exacerbated uh, by the new media landscape, where if you want to, you can go to a website that is very far to the right or very far to the left and use that as your main source of, uh, of information. And it makes it uh, that much harder, I would argue, uh, for anyone to get anything done in Washington. Um, and, um, you know, I've made a sort of critical comment of, uh, of Barack Obama in the way that um, he has not nurtured the development of the Democratic Party. Uh, he never, from my perspective again, nurtured a good working relationship with uh, Congress. And um, sure, it's difficult. and. He, is, he would be fighting against uh, people who uh, would like to see him out of office and all that. Uh, I realize that. Um, but the way our system is designed and the way that it's supposed to work is you somehow find a way, um, but you keep talking and you keep working and you keep uh, trying to uh, accomplish something. Uh, if it means going to the middle, okay, uh, let's figure that one uh, out. But until we, we sort of overcome this polarization, as long as we keep to the extremes, um, I think we are probably um, going to face some periods when um, the anger of the electorate will be uh, even stronger than it is today. Well, Bob, I wish we could continue this discussion for another hour. It's, uh, it's been fascinating, but unfortunately we're uh, all out of time. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us today yeah. and, 
and uh, sharing your expertise. It was, uh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who uh, joined us live or who are watching later. Remember to uh, keep up on all past and upcoming editions of our uh, different online learning programs. You can visit the Alumni Association at my.nd.edu slash learn, or you can go to YouTube and search for the Notre Dame Alumni Association. I'm Kevin Brennan. Thanks so much for watching, and go Irish.